my basic stand is there's no person there there's no thinker there there's no controller there there are only various personalities who float in and float out they take possession of you and make use of you your body or your consciousness and there are times when no personality also is there that's a still higher state but to be aware that personalities are merely flowing through you is also the enlightened state so they come through you and they pass out of you and they can come from anywhere so we can create new personalities we can also destroy existing personalities anything could be done because there's no person there anybody could walk in anybody could walk out you would be experiencing conflict because yes. these two personalities would be fighting what you realize is there is conflict going on between two or, th- or more personalities you are witnessing from outside the ring the boxing is going on mm-hmm. but you are watching it uh, just like uh, the shirt that you are wearing is not really your shirt you are not the one who tailored it you are not the one who grew the cotton which went into it in fact the whole universe has gone into it and still you call it your shirt so thought has taken uh, millions of years to evolve it is there in the thought sphere and we're just borrowing thoughts so by no stretch of imagination could you call them your thoughts because you are not the creator and it is so complex a lot of things have gone into creating that thought like your shirt and you are merely wearing it so that's all there is to it so how could it be your thought you're not the designer you're not the creator actually people when they go to certain places they can pick up the thoughts which are in the thought sphere there and they will be complete strangers to her thoughts uh, on one occasion a gentleman came to me a 65 year old and he was weeping i asked him what's the matter with you he said i am 65 i've been a clean good man but uh, the last few hours i am seized with lustful thoughts which had never happened to in my life uh, then i asked him did it happen all of a sudden he said yes then i said could you tell me which place then he told me a uh, so and so place you know then i remembered the suicide pact between a boy and a girl who were in love and they had committed suicide there then i told him it's exactly because you went there maybe another 6 hours you'll be free of it and the man became free of it so because he went to that spot he picked up the thoughts there and he was experiencing it as though they were his thoughts and the poor man having led a very spiritual life was deeply disturbed hmm. and the next 6 hours is completely free especially after he got this clarity so thoughts just come and flow they could arise from the body also even if they arise from the body they still not your thoughts they could arise from anywhere when all the personal suffering has come to an end we would say you are enlightened we of course make a difference between the enlightened state and enlightenment itself now the enlightened state is more like a peak experience which may or may not result in enlightenment but enlightenment is a permanent irreversible state and uh, the most fundamental thing about uh, enlightenment is there is no more personal suffering suffering is there but it is no more personal if you see somebody suffer you also suffer that is there but there's no such thing as personal suffering Uh, that is what uh, we would call as enlightenment which is very different from the enlightened state which is a peak state and it, which is so different uh, from actual enlightenment basically if a person uh, has become enlightened as different from the enlightened state he should himself know that uh, he has made it Uh, because he would certainly see a clear difference between what he was earlier and what he is now all that is required is he has to try to remember how he was in the past and he will see a definite uh, uh, difference there and he will find that something is missing somebody is not there that's how he would uh, but he might not know unless we define that as enlightenment he might not know that he will just feel that there is a difference that's all so the definitions do help him in that sense to say yes a thing has happened to me and there are also people who uh, uh, who are actually enlightened uh who know clearly that they are enlightened because they have come and told us i have made it i am enlightened i am not there and we have checked and we have found that to be true that also is there and there are also people who have actually become enlightened and still are not aware that they are enlightened whom uh, 
we have had to educate and then they became clear so all possibilities are there there is a huge variety of flavors uh, no two people are identical uh, in some people um, the, uh, the what is very characteristic about them is the absence of conflict in some people there is a tremendous silence all the time with them and in, in some people there is this unconditional love flowing through them uh, some are uh, the state of uh, unconditional joy so various qualities are predominant in various people it's not exactly the same because it depends upon how the parietal lobes are how the uh, uh, frontal lobes are and how uh, the general system is functioning how the energy is flowing to the nadis so all these things make that uh, difference some can be so ecstatic that they cannot even uh, uh, move around and there are those who are uh, who are running around in ecstasy so all varieties are there the uh, continuation is that um, you can clearly be uh, see that uh, the mind is out there and that it is functioning on its own and that uh, you can just witness it uh, doing all the work and normally we call at this stage we call the mind a small bird and the one uh, who is witnessing as the big bird so we would say you have moved into the big uh, into the big bird and you are watching the small bird but within the small bird there is conflict there is thought everything is there and at the next level of uh, development uh, the conflict ceases so as the big bird watches the small bird there's no conflict in the small bird and at a at a higher level thoughts to have vanished from the small bird and at a still higher level the small bird itself has vanished so it keeps going on that way and then at one point the big bird also vanishes and you feel that you are the universe so all these things keep happening but we generally don't talk much about it people uh, discover it on their own uh, enlightenment is the basic realization that you don't actually exist and there's no personal suffering because we talk about enlightenment in many different ways but the commonest definition is there's an end to personal suffering and an end to the feeling that uh, you exist as an individual but uh, god realization is something totally different where you realize that there is an entity a power with which you could relate and you could get your things done that is what we call god realization and uh, ultimately you becoming that god yourself yes uh, the, the lobes keep changing a lot more um and as the lobes keep changing uh, ultimately there comes a point when you see that the god whom you are praying to or relating to is but yourself first it comes as an insight then as some kind of uh, realization and then an actual happening occurs when the uh, the shift happens you know then you know then you are like christ saying i and my father are one that happens when you just say enlightenment uh, we might not call that as oneness but uh, as you as your enlightenment becomes deeper and deeper you come to a point where actually you see that you are the other that the other completely ceases to exist that uh, you were the other actually one that's when we would say you are in a state of oneness right now you might feel uh, let us say uh, the tree is there and you are there and without any running commentary you are watching the tree but that is not oneness the kind of oneness we are talking about is you actually experience the tree as though you have become the tree that is the that's when we say you are uh, you are into oneness an enlightened person cannot give it to another it is only possible if there's a uh, a lot of people on the planet are enlightened if they are enlightened then it's possible for enlightened people to give it to others so initially i took a a lot of time to be able to give it to others it, and it uh, involved a lot of hard work and then i have been slowly uh, giving a few people and built up an order of 170 people who are enlightened now with their help i have been giving it to others and as others are making it i am able to give it to more people and now uh, we are slowly approaching a point where uh, they will be able to give it effortlessly to others that is how the phenomenon has been growing 
because enlightenment wherever it has happened it has happened not because uh, the person uh, did this or did that and very often in spite of what he did it happened so it has been a happening but i do believe that uh, uh, in ancient times enlightenment was being given by the masters to their students uh, but somehow uh, it was all lost so i wouldn't say it's totally new but i would say it's very very ancient there after what seems to have been happening was it was just happening here and there across the planet but now it seems to have come back whereby it is possible to give it to another uh, people who have uh, excellent uh, relationships and the people who have a lot of spiritual discontent uh, they who are not satisfied with uh, all that they might have in the world and uh, who have been really seeking hard uh, these are the people who are best prepared to receive this and uh, it's easy for uh, us to give it to them but as more and more people are making it we find that even people who are less qualified are able to make it essentially that's the most important thing because we have found that wherever the process has not worked invariably it has led to a problem between uh, the seeker and the father or, or the seeker and the mother then the process just stops so we get back to working on that and then once again the process uh, proceeds if the seeker has not uh, abused his body uh, then it would be very very helpful if the seeker has been abusing his body too much then also it becomes difficult but i'm using in case he has uh, drunk a lot he has smoked a lot he has used to drugs when uh, if he has uh, done all these things then it does uh, become difficult but on the other hand if he has if you have not taken recourse to uh, these things the process goes on much more smoothly uh, that also is quite a hindrance if you are uh, stressed out or if you are uh, too much worried and then also it becomes a problem uh, but uh, we do not complain against this uh, complain against these things we try to overcome these things it becomes very often a hindrance and it uh, prevents you from becoming enlightened so if only you could see the damage which uh, this kind of seeking is causing then that could be of help but really you cannot be free of seeking the seeking is there but all that you must see is how the seeking is preventing you from becoming enlightened if you could get that insight then it makes our job very easy in fact really there's nothing to do you know but the problem is people have no idea about not doing anything so they feel they must do something to get there but that very effort is the self they don't seem to realize that they want to end the self but the effort to end the self is the self some of them must get the insight that that is the self then maybe suddenly it could stop yes the grace comes in it stops it for you when i use the word self i use it in the sense of uh, this feeling of separateness from the other that's what i mean uh, by the word self and uh, it's my understanding that it is uh, arising out of the way the senses are functioning and if the sensory coordination is slowed down a bit the self disappears you you no longer feel you are separate it's actually an illusion the sense of separateness is an illusion because in man's natural state you cannot have this illusion because that is not the truth and man has acquired this illusion and ever since he's been suffering ultimately we can trace all the wars the environmental degradation and the poverty everything back to this illusion i see this as a people's movement you know where a spiritual power uh, would percolate to the level of the ordinary uh, masses and that um, i expect everybody to be a mystic everybody to be enlightened and everybody to have a enormous spiritual power to do miracles so I believe that we will be creating a world where there, there will be no spiritual hierarchy, where uh, everybody is his own guru and everybody is his own sishya. I think we are heading for that.
that I uh, discovered that I had the power to transform people. Earlier, there was the power to help people uh, with their problems, uh, but uh, I could not really bring about transformation in the sense that uh, we call enlightenment. I did bring about some transformation in people, but it wasn't enlightenment. I did discover that I could give Diksha and uh, bring about enlightenment. Uh, diksha is uh, a transfer of energy. So uh, one gets into the state uh, of enlightenment and though one is enlightened, there's a thing called the enlightened state. Uh, there's a difference between the two. So you get into an enlightened state and then you transfer those energies. The spread of enlightenment. So what I do is I transfer it to my uh, followers who in turn transfer it to uh, other people. And uh, these energies are received by what, we, what uh, we call the sensory cells, which in turn take it to different parts of the brain and to different parts of the body, where a biological transformation occurs, which results in enlightenment. Uh, actually, even in the ancient tradition, the Guru is expected to give enlightenment. Uh, you do not become enlightened on your own. Your sadhana is only a preparation to receive diksha. And the Guru is supposed to give it to you. So it was never the idea that uh, in the Hindu tradition that you make it on your own. So the Guru has to give it to you. Hence uh, what we call the Guru tradition or the Guru Parampara. The further spread of enlightenment. Uh, now my contention is, I don't see individuals as individuals. I see only humanity. And humanity has been here for ages now. And I believe humanity has done its sadhana and it is ready for this transformation. That is why I tell now that no sadhana is required. Not that I deny sadhana, but sadhana has been done by mankind. It's all ready now. Hence it is possible to give diksha to the whole of humanity. I intend to do it through several means. Uh, I intend to get ready about 80,000 people who would be able to give diksha to the rest of mankind. But these dikshas could be of various kinds. Now, if there were a painter, he could produce paintings and people looking at those paintings could receive diksha. Now, I am musicians who through their musical performance would be able to give diksha. So, it will take various forms. So, there could be somebody who could give a talk and in, and in his talk, diksha could occur and there could be enlightenment. And it would be their responsibility to enlighten mankind. And they will be spread across the globe in all the countries of the planet. The relationship between man and God. This is what I'm trying to do. You know? Produce a lot of spiritual teachers, spiritual gurus. So trying to empower the ordinary person. He becomes a leader and helps mankind. So you could say that all of my followers are leaders themselves. I believe because man is right for that. I think humanity is right for this major transition. Basically, uh, what's happening in this work is the relationship between man and God is changing. So God is becoming a very, very personal friend here now. So the whole concept of God is undergoing a transformation. The future of religions. I think uh, all teachers and uh, all faiths, uh, they are helping man up to a point. And of course, they're also creating division between man and man. There's both the positive and the negative sides to religion. But um, it's my feeling that uh, in the next few years as humanity becomes enlightened, uh, I see that these religions will undergo a radical transformation. I see some kind of uh, a universal spirituality emerging, minus all the, the decorative elements of uh, religion. And I think that each one is going to create his own personal religion. A common religion, I think, would be dead. Each one would be creating his own ethical code, his own moral code, his own teachings, his own faith. I think it's all going to be highly individualistic in that sense. The end of human division. See, basically, my understanding is that all human problems and all worldly problems, they emerge from the fact that man functions from a narrow, individualistic self. So when you do become enlightened, the self is no more there. You are only part of a big wholeness. So when you function from 
uh, that level of consciousness, you cannot indulge in any kind of divisive behavior or action. And there can never be any conflict at all, which is uh, not only the absence of conflict between man and man, but also between man and nature. And nobody would ever even dream of exploiting nature. So the whole scenario is going to change. So we are going to enter a very different world where we would function as one family, the oneness movement. Because uh, the closest you can come to enlightenment is the sense of oneness. Enlightenment is a real and tangible solution. What we have noticed is people have come here to become enlightened. They have become enlightened and they have gone back to their homes. And enlightenment has naturally occurred in their homes to people who have not heard of the movement, who have not even heard of the word enlightenment. It is spreading. We find it is affecting uh, the family and in very many cases we find the family members naturally making it. In a majority of cases this is happening. That is why we are talking that 80,000 people make it. That is enough for mankind to transit into the new age. What will happen to the world order after enlightenment? This transformation is not going to bring down our civilization and take us back to the stone age. Certainly we are going to have all the good things that man has created over the last several centuries. But then it, certain things could go out of business like the defense industry for example. But uh, because uh, enlightenment is going to spread across the globe, including those who own these businesses, I think they will find better avenues to uh, earn money and to spend their money more usefully. I think there is no danger from them because they would be enlightened themselves. If they were not enlightened, a definitive danger is there. But since they too are going to be enlightened, whether they like it or not, so there is not going to be much trouble. Obstacles for enlightenment. You must see what the mental blocks are. Most often it is fear of enlightenment itself uh, which becomes a block or lack of confidence. Otherwise people make it quite easy. But yes, normally after the Diksha is taken, its lifetime is about six months. So in the following weeks, in the following months, it could happen. But the only drawback here is if you are subjected to too much of stress, then uh, it dies down. But let us say if you have to lead a very tranquil, calm life, especially in your water bodies like lakes and rivers, the process will restart and complete itself. But then if you are going to live in a city like New York with its pollution and stress levels, it could become very difficult. Even there it is possible if somehow you could change your mental perception and you would enjoy the crowds of New York and enjoy New York life, still the process would continue. But if you become judgmental and if you start condemning aspects of that life, then the process stops. Everyone will have a unique form of enlightenment. I believe that uh, the self is the disease. But uh, when you are born as a child, you do not have a self. self. Uh, it comes into existence at a particular time. And I believe if all things go well, it should also cease. But uh, that doesn't happen. So, if that does not happen, you are deceased. So my function here, and those of the people who have become enlightened, is to remove that disease, remove the self. And then you are fine once again, you are in your natural state. And in that natural state, there could not be any conflict. That is what it is to be truly human. To be truly human is to be an individual. No? There is no, no more divisions inside you. There is no conflict. And yet it remains an individual. Each one is unique. You will not be able to compare two people. If there are six billion people, there are six billion uniquely enlightened people. Each one is unique. That is the whole beauty about it. It is no such thing as mass enlightenment. It would, uh, it could be done for the masses, but then each one is unique it's in the mass. The self is a disease. Enlightenment cannot be compared. It could be so different from uh, between two individuals. Uh, uh, a couple comes and the husband becomes enlightened in one way and the wife in another way. You cannot compare. Yet they will be the best of friends. Two friendships will be discovered in their lives. Because uh, it's so tangible, it is. It's something very real, it is a connection. To have a self is to be deceased. And the humanity just as self is a deceased humanity. And all that is born out of the self, whether it's economics or politics or your medicine, everything is deceased. It's a miracle that we have survived. The experience of the enlightened. We have found that a lot of people who are enlightened are actually free of uh, 
long standing chronic ailments so we do find a remarkable improvement in health also in both the physical and mental health the cells of the body become more sensitive they become more sensitive and uh, with their becoming more sensitive uh, the whole body becomes more healthier that also happens and because you can experience nature very differently you know the senses are functioning at a higher efficiency so it's a beautiful world that you live in how would the enlightened one perceive the nature actually there is no comparison at all the two are totally different when you say this mountain is beautiful it's a comment being made by your mind uh, it is the description and not the described but when you're enlightened you become the mountain which is totally different the way the mountain would appear to you is different it's something which has to be experienced it cannot be described now, all this appreciation you're talking about love and beauty uh, is more a description it is not the thing that is the basic difference yeah, they're very very different only after awakening do you start to live once you become enlightened the senses function differently because you do not have a self you are freed of the interference of the mind so without the mind interfering you are experiencing life through the senses which is a totally different experience which i call living so the first time you really begin to live and uh, one can't really describe it one has to experience and once you start doing it you have no problems on this planet there could be problems but they never affect you even your enemy looks like your friend you can't think badly and uh, about him and you can't harm him love pours out it just happens suppose you see somebody beating a dog you experience the pain of the dog so you do not come from a mental concept oh he is beating the dog let's help the dog now it's not from some mental concept or belief you experience the pain the dog is experiencing so you, you just act from that you don't think and uh, act okay. it's spontaneous action that's all you live in the moment what happens to the past after enlightenment the past no more interferes except when you want it to help you like the technical problem you want to set like this camera the past comes out and helps you then immediately this is to the background you do not keep thinking about the camera it's, it's cut it's over so the past becomes your slave it is at your beck and call you make use of it right now it is making use of you when you are not enlightened when you are not living the past is as possessed you it is making use of your life for its survival because it functions like an entity so your life is in bondage to the past it could be a belief it could be a dogma it could be a concept it could be anything it it has gripped you know it's yes. holding you in its grip you're being made yourself